Hey everyone, it's Clint. Video two, I'm committed. I'm doing this series. I don't care about the views. Uh, but actually, it's great to hear from back uh, back from many of you in the comment section in the last video that you're happy I'm doing this series. So I am doing this series for those of you out there that, that this will help. Uh, and I actually think it, again, this is important, how to write comics. Even if you already know how to write comics, you've already written comics perhaps or something else, it's always helpful to hear someone's take and someone's process uh, because it could inform your own and you can, I don't know, find things your own way. And speaking of your own way, that really is going to be a big section of this video. I wanted to talk about outlining. The more I thought about it, I think it's important to get structure out of the way first. So understanding the structure that you're going for, and then we'll move in to outlining and get a little bit more specific. So we're going to look at a few things here. Why don't we, um, first I'm going to pull up three act structure. Um, there are a lot of ways to structure a story. And in fact, I would argue that there are infinite ways to structure a story because even within a three act structure, uh, you can achieve a three act structure so differently depending on who you are and the way that you're going to approach a story that I don't really think, um, it applies all the time. 100%. Having said that, there are some important things with structuring a story um, that I think it's best for most people to look at a story structure and to have it in mind as you're plotting out your story uh, because it's going to feel right to a lot of people. If you ever read a book or a you know comic book or watch a, a movie or anything and something just doesn't feel right with the flow of the story, a lot of that is because I don't know, maybe they hit and miss on the structure. Maybe there was no structure. It didn't work quite well. So three act structure is what I'm going to be looking at. It's beginning, middle and end. Essentially, I'm going to go through each of the things that you should consider when you're writing your comic book. There's so much on three act structure that if you want to learn more about structure, just search it in YouTube. There's going to be fantastic videos. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the structure itself, but just know that it essentially informs the shape of your story as, uh, oh gosh, Alan Moore would call it the shape of your story, which is an interesting way to put it. And, and it actually makes quite a bit of sense. So I continued on here. I have my idea. I, you know, wrote out what it is uh, that I'm looking at, and now I'm going to carry this over into my structure. Uh, now this is not normally how I write a book. <laughs> I don't actually write it out. Uh, like this and have my acts sort of know what happens in each act. But I think it's helpful again for the video that we see this uh, together. So first, we're going to look at the first act. For me personally, the beginning is the most difficult part to write. I know a lot of people say the mini middle is the most difficult or a lot of people say the end is the most difficult. I don't know. It's all very difficult. It's quite challenging to write. Um, and especially if you're trying to make it really good. Uh, and so this will definitely help as far as that goes. So act one is typically one quarter of the length of your whole story. So in this case, remember, we've already talked about this as being a 22 page story. So in this case, that leaves me 5.5 pages for act one. So it could be five pages, could be six pages, could be a whole lot longer, depending on how long your story is could be shorter. And this isn't a hard and fast rule. It's just sort of a general uh, rule of thumb. Now for a 22 page one shot, I'd say five pages is probably about the right length anyway that you'd want to spend uh, opening things up. So another thing you want to establish here is the status quo. One of my favorite memes now uh, that, that's so helpful to writing has been like, uh, tell me, let's see, what was the one I saw? Tell me, you're an introvert without telling me you are an introvert. And then you, you post some kind of a meme or a statement or an image or something that's going to point to that without saying it. I love that meme because that is exactly show don't tell. Show don't tell is not ref, ref, referring have art there, don't have words. It's actually just about writing. So while you can use images, that's the beauty of comics, you can use images to show things uh, more importantly is if you're writing it in your script, why is it there? You can say an awful, a lot of really important words 
that are going to show the reader something without telling them. So keep that meme in mind. Uh, it's extremely helpful. Uh, so status quo characterization. So, you know, what I'm, and what I'm thinking about here specifically, the status quo, how do I show people, remember this was about a, a lackey, right? That's uh, going in for a job interview. That's my concept. What is his life like? Well, he's kind of a loser. Not he's he's a loser. He has nothing really going for him, and he has a pretty violent background of violence and failure, for that matter. Uh, so we're setting him up. So this characterization status quo, this is what we're going to nail down. So without telling the reader that this person is a loser, I need to show them that he's kind of a loser. How am I going to do that? This is exactly how you're going to to craft your first scene, right? You can make a scene that is going to set you up for success and to show the reader these things. So, uh, you know, I could have him looking through some, you know, maybe he just checked the mail and he's got a ton of bills uh, that he, are unpaid. Maybe he's got uh, bill collectors calling him. You know, that's going to show us that he's got financial problems. Uh, and maybe they could be really stupid bills that, you know, you wouldn't pay for normally credit card bills or, you know, just ridiculous. We're not talking about cancer bills or anything where we would feel sympathetic for him. We're thinking of uh, something that that just shows he's a loser, right? So you could think about that a little bit. Characterization, how does he act with somebody? You're going to want to have some kind of communication here. This could be seeing someone at a bus stop, seeing a neighbor. How does he treat his neighbors? How does he treat uh, an animal walking down the street? This is often where people have the pet the cat moment when you want people to like a character. In this case, I kind of want you know, you'd maybe feel a little bad for the guy, but he's not exactly a great person. And that's going to set up my character arc. Uh, you're also going to want to give the setting and the rules for the world that you're living, they're living in. Um, we're going to talk about the catalyst in a moment here. This is really important for act one. Uh, not only that, but you're going to want to make some promises to your reader. So if you read a book and you're in act one, you're essentially going to lay out the kinds of writing tools that you're going to use throughout the rest of the book. So if your book's going to have a lot of profanity, uh, I think having profanity in act one is actually giving someone a promise as to what they're going to read throughout the rest of the book. Uh, it, you know, it might not be the same, you know what I mean? But you're going to set the tone as to what they can expect. Um, and this sort of sets things off. If it's going to be happy, go lucky or funny, you, again, you're setting the tone here and you're going to follow that throughout the story. Another thing I'd point out that's very specific to comics is if you are going to be telling this story completely in the third person, if there's not going to be a narrator, there's not going to be any kind of, um, uh, omnipresent, uh, yeah, narrator giving you a perspective, or you're not going to hear very close uh, first person accounts of, uh, you know, what somebody's going through and you're just sticking to balloons. It's better to, to set that up in act one and stick with it throughout the rest of the book rather than changing back and forth. If you want to go with that narrative, that's an awesome choice. But you understand my point. You're going to decide in act one, how you're going to tell this story and you're going to stick with that throughout. You're not going to change uh, and all of a sudden there's a narrator that shows up in act two or three, you're going to stick with it. Be consistent. Uh, that is important. I think, especially for comics. Um, okay. Then the catalyst, you're going to have some event that essentially shakes the status quo. It, uh, crushes it like an egg. It, you know, whatever it is, but it's going to force your character to make a decision and act in some way. Right. And that'll be important for the rest of the story. Uh, so that's act one. Is there more to it? Sure, there can be. Uh, there can also be a lot less to it. But this is, I think, in essence, what you want in an act one. Now, keep in mind, my restrictions here are I have 22 pages. And so what I don't want to do is introduce tons and tons of characters here in act one. Really, I want to probably focus on one or two relationships uh, with characters in this case, I think I'm going to have the, our lackey going in for a job interview 
and uh, one of the you know lackeys that works there already that he's going to be interviewing with. I could also have the top villain uh, that our, our main character is uh, you know hoping to get a job for, um, even if that main villain is not here in that uh, particular act one, you can still show people and give them an understanding of what this villain is like. I think there could be a lot of interesting things you could do here, but the, the trick is, is to fit it into 5.5 pages, essentially, uh, give or take. So uh, again, that's important. If that if you're, the length of your book is 22 pages, you're going to have to pay attention to uh, you know, what you're going to, what you're going to accomplish. So you set your goals out. That's act one act two. This would, uh, you know, even out to about 11 pages for a 22 page comic book, uh, script, uh, again, give or take a few, but this is going to take up the majority, uh, or half of the story just in act two. So it's the longest act. Uh, an important thing here is that you're building tension and that's going to look differently. I showed you the three act structure and it sort of just looks like a ramp that's constantly building up tension. But the reality is that, I mean, the best stories aren't just, you know, hitting one note, building the tension straight away. You actually have, you know, a little bit of give and take. So you're building more tension by sort of also releasing tension. There's sort of a, yeah, again, it's a bit of a give and take in order to build tension. Uh, you can do a lot more world building here. Uh, you know, show again, show us what the world is like without saying it. Show us again with your words. How do people talk in this world? Like, there's a lot of things you can do here. Uh, your character arcs. This is so important. I see a lot of writers uh, making this mistake, and that is that their characters never change. They just exist. They are what they are, and they'll remain that way forever. And so it's important, I think, for every single character uh, that has any kind of real presence in your story to give them a character arc. And it doesn't have to be complex. So uh, in, in this case, I have my main character, the lackey, and he starts out as a bit of a loser. Maybe I'm going to give you something in Act 1 that gives you just a glimpse that he has some redeemable quality to him. He could literally be petting a cat. I don't know. <laughs> he could be doing something, but I got to show you that he has a little bit of hope. Uh, but generally speaking, he's a bit of a loser that's making poor decisions. Um, my story arc could be that I want him to learn and change and become a better person or redeem himself. And so I have to find ways throughout my story to achieve that. Now, what about the guy he's interviewing with? he's, you know, pretty integral to my story. They're going to be communicating with each other quite a bit. He's the other character uh, for most of it. So I need to also think of a character arc for him. Again, it doesn't have to be much, but maybe this guy is super untrusting. And so he's uh, very suspicious of the lackey who is trying to join the team. And uh, he's not very impressed, but by the end, he learns to relax a little bit. It can absolutely be that simple, especially for a character like that. That's not net. He's not the main character. He's not, um, it's not who we're following along, but these little character arcs are very important and you're going to want to have one for your villain as well. If you have a main antagonist, having a character arc for them is going to make them such a, it's just so much more interesting of a character rather than just uh, being, again, the same person beginning to end. So plan those character arcs from the get-go. One more thing that you're going to want to consider, and again, you're going to be developing in Act 2, but you're going to put it here with the catalyst. So two things. Your main character is going to have some kind of external conflict. This is important. Uh, this would be... Um, you know, Frodo needs to take the ring to Mount Doom and throw it, throw it in Mount Doom. Uh, but there's also an internal character arc or excuse me, an internal conflict. And these are two things that they're going to have to overcome. So again, when I talk about character arcs, that internal conflict is what they're going to be dealing with that changes them as a person as they resolve it. Um, those external character arcs are those ones that are the most obvious and upfront. And so they're both important. You're going to absolutely want both. And depending on the length of your story and the number of characters that you want to develop, 
you're going to also want internal uh, internal conflict for those other characters as well as it makes sense you know you don't again you don't want to bite off more than you can chew and make character soup but really those characters that you're developing external conflict internal conflict and uh yeah so that gets set off on the catalyst act one act two you're going to be building upon those things uh build tension build the world work on those character arcs make sure that each character that you have an arc for is being developed and uh, you know, the reader understands where you're going with this. So you're going to also allow to set up for your ending uh, during this section. So it, it's so much more of a payoff when you see something happen earlier in a story that then does it becomes a great consequence later on. Uh, one example of this, which can be a very simple thing, is uh, what was that movie called? Jojo Rabbit. Uh, if, spoiler alerts in case you haven't seen it, but one little component of uh, sort of just this uh, character's relationship, the young boy with his mother, is he would get down and tie his mother's shoes. And so you'd often see, be met with this camera angle of this boy uh, down on the ground by his mother's shoes, and you just see her shoes. He ties her shoes, and it's it's such a mundane thing. But again, spoiler alert, Later on in the movie, uh, you see those same shoes. He's confronted with those shoes, and that shows you that his mother has actually been hanged. She's been murdered. And so uh, you see the same shoes, and he goes and ties her shoes. And that sounds like something so simple, but in context, because we set it up, it becomes massive. It's so important. It's such a big moment uh, that you know you see those mother's shoes as she is hanging. Uh, you don't have to see anything else. It's not about the gore, or the death. It's about those shoes. And so act two is where you want to be thinking about those things. And um, you're setting things up to later uh, become more important. This is where you add the context that makes those things so meaningful that would otherwise not be meaningful. All right. Another thing I'll point out here is try fell. Uh, it's trying and failing. Just that simple Nothing comes easy. If you have a character that everything comes easy for, it's going to become very boring very quickly. So you're actually going to build tension by having your character try to overcome these uh, tasks, these other stakes that sort of build upon each other. And your character is going to, going to fail and sometimes fail multiple times trying to achieve, uh, you know, these different tasks that he's setting out to do. Um, and as you do that, again, it's going to big build tension. Uh, and then at some point in this act two, uh, there is, generally speaking, some kind of big moment. And sometimes, I mean, often it's a smack dab in the middle of act two. It can be, again, not, you, you make the shape of your story. But this moment is either a big win where, I don't know, I think of like the Dark Knight uh, when they get all these mobsters put into jail. Harvey Dent seems to be uh, doing exactly what Harvey Dent needs to do, you know? So it feels like a really big win. Um, and then you can have those dreams absolutely dashed. There are other stories, I can't think of a hard example right now, but where, you know, as they're going through these tri fell cycles, there's a massive failure that just seems ground, ground shaking. And it becomes a, a turning point that happens in act two. Uh, th those are all important. It can also be a revelation. It's new information. It's, it's something uh, that changes things quite a bit. Uh, but it, th that usually happens in act two, somewhere along the middle. A few more things I want to add, though, is having variety. Uh, this is, again, where you can show, don't tell. You can do this with locations of your scenes. Uh, pick locations that are more interesting. Um, if you have to deal with some exposition, make it in a really interesting place. You know, there's lots of things you can do to make it a much more visually uh, interesting place. But even still, you're going to want to shake it up a little bit. You're going to want to have moments of faster pace, uh, maybe action or just faster pace. You're going to want to have moments that are a little bit slower uh, and this variety is going to help you build up tension and just make it a much more interesting story. 
at the end of the day, your point here in act two is to progress the plot. You have got to get to your goals that are in act three. You've got to move the story along. You don't want people to get lost or it to feel like it's uh, something that it's not. You got to deliver on those promises. Assuming you have an act one that's just, you know, great, gets people interested and exciting. All right, so moving into act three, this would be the remaining 5.5 pages. Roughly speaking, for a 22-page comic book script, this is going to contain the climax of the story. You're going to wrap things up. Uh, I Nothing bothers me more than uh, watching a movie that has a climax and it doesn't wrap anything up whatsoever. <laughs> uh, it's super frustrating to me. This is where you want to want to pay off. Now, you're going to have little payoffs probably throughout Act 2 where characters are trying and succeeding. Uh, they don't always fail. Uh, so you're going to have some payoff, but really this is the big moment of payoff uh, is in act three. There's going to be some kind of resolution that could be done many different ways. And if you're writing a comic book script, it might be a good idea to actually leave a cliffhanger, uh, which is, you know, a, a potentially just hinting at some foreshadowing of uh, another, another inciting incident or, or catalyst for the next leg of the story. And so you see all of this becomes a bit of a pattern. It can seem a little bit circular, but there's so many ways to do it that it uh, can end up being uh, pretty good. So I'm going to show you here. This is actually the reprint of Downcast 1 and 2. I'm glad that I have the I'm reprinting these together because those four alternate issues, those first two volumes together, essentially make up a complete story. Uh, having a beginning and a middle and end, I think is important in every single issue. Uh, and you'll notice in every act, there's essentially a beginning and a middle and an end. But in this case, I really, um, I don't know, having those four together is the complete uh, story arc, essentially, of the, that first story arc. So I'll show you what I mean here and take you through my thought process. By no means is this like the perfect way to do it, but I just want to show you how it is. So initially, I want to show the status quo, floating city in the sky. There's some crime that's rampant. And uh, so that sort of introduces my villains and uh, how it's going. Admittedly, these are some baddies that are a, a bit one dimensional, uh, which, you know, I think it's fixed a little bit later on. Um, here, though, we are introduced to our main characters, their status quo. Again, just they're working uh, blue collar jobs they're cleaning windows. And they're, through their conversation, the goal is to show you that they are struggling with money and they really miss their dad. Those are uh, a couple things there. And then here is the beginning of the catalyst. It's when these two worlds collide. So I have this uh, deadliner being thrown out the window and uh, <laughs> through this action scene, they get the power to control gravity. It falls right into their laps or into their bucket in this case. So this is doing a few things. It's it's a promise. It's setting up how I'm going to tell the story. Um, in this case, that action is going to be part of this story, uh, that it is going to be about family. Those are some of the themes. Again, I never said, but I tried to show you through the dialogue and the relationships that were going on there. And I even set up some uh, baselines for where these characters are at. Um, in this case, I have Jax, who is trying to be helpful <laughs> and he's very protective trying to help and protect his sister and at the same time he's hesitant uh to help here in just this jacks do something um and so which he finally does but it sort of sets up that he has this hesitancy um again just action this is just how i'm telling the story i'll go up a little bit here i want to just show you one thing and that is the use of caption boxes to have a bit of a disembodied narrator. And uh, uh, that was a choice that I didn't use a lot uh, throughout the story, but I did use, you see it in Downcast too. But again, this would be uh, sort of just setting the tone for how I'm going to tell this story. Um, and I'll tell you in Downcast 3, I actually don't have that. I don't have narration happening at all. It's been kind of fun to sort of switch it up on as to how I'm going to be telling the story. Uh, anyway, so this ends. Act one is actually pretty long, but if you compare it, it's like 120 pages total. So uh, act one ends with them 
on this building, they have a bit of a resolution here, and that is that they have the power to control gravity. They're getting out of there, right? They survived, they have some resolution, but clearly there's some problems because we're, uh, you know, they're afraid for their lives at this moment. So that is how I would set up uh, act one in 120 pages uh, worth of graphic novel. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. So thank you for watching. Let me know if you have specific questions. I'd love to answer them. I think next time we will get into how I would actually outline this out and uh, we'll go with my story of the lackey here and uh, hopefully that's helpful. So thanks so much and I will see you in the next video.